Hey, what's up, guys? I want to talk about eat to eat meat or to not to eat meat, okay? And I am asking that we can have this conversation in a place of respect, in a place of open-mindedness. I'm not telling you that you shouldn't do that. I'm not telling you that you should. I don't have, um, what is it? Like, I don't have a, any skin in the game on this. Like, I have friends who are plant-based, people I respect who are plant-based. I'm not here to offend anyone or tell them they're wrong or, you know, anything like that. I just want to open up some interesting pieces of information. Um, especially because I have a podcast and I'm grateful to have the podcast because I get to talk to a lot of experts who have done heavy amounts of research on some of these topics. And I just want to open up the conversation around some of them. Um, I will say I've had clients who have come to me and were vegan for a period of time and it was detrimental to their health. I have had clients who are vegan and their blood work looks really good. Okay. So I'm not here to say do it or don't do it. I don't like dogma because nobody knows how the body works completely. And who are we to say that whatever complex set of issues are going on in your body, that that might not be the best thing for you. So if it intuitively feels like you're like, no, I'm plant-based and it feels I am like definitely better. My blood works better. My energy is better. Every, my whole life is better. I honor that. Okay. <laughs> I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. I do want to open up some, um, conversation around it though, because there is a lot of dogma out there. There are a lot of, um, I would say very biased opinions out there. It happens in everything. It's in the keto world. It's in the carnivore world. It's in, you know, religion. Like there's always going to be some dogma. So let's talk about just, I'm going to talk about some, um, concerns that I have with the plant-based diet, just in case anybody out there might be experiencing some of these things just to be aware. Okay. So um, I have a podcast on this with Rob Wolf. Hopefully you guys follow Rob Wolf, R-O-B-B-W-O-L-F. I, I consider him to be one of the greatest nu nutritionists in the world. Um, and he has a book that he co-authored with a woman named Diana Rogers, and they both put awesome content. Diana puts really good content um, about this on her um, Instagram. It's Sustainable Dish is the name of her Instagram account. Just lots of education. So they wrote this book called Sacred Cow. Um, it actually got turned into a documentary that you can watch. Um, and he, what they wrote about in the book were the environmental, ethical, and health considerations of not eating meat. Okay, so they put immense amount of research and time. Actually traveled the world visiting ranchers in Mexico. I've watched their film. It's, it's great. Um, and so they're just, they, they went at it as open-minded as possible. You'll see if you watch my interview with Rob Wolf on my Inside Out Help podcast that he's actually some of the things that people sh say all the time about why you should eat meat. He's like, mm, no. It's okay, so they're, they're being open-minded about it. So the first thing is... I like to talk about land mass, okay? Because I love Mother Earth so much. And um, one really cool way that Rob puts this is like when we, so people, why are people generally plant-based? One reason is they think it's better for the earth, right? That's what you hear a lot. This is going to be better for the environment. Now, CAFOs and terrible management of animals, you know, those f feed lots where they're being fed corn and they're pumped with stuff and they're sick and like, we're all against that. Nobody who's eating meat is like, yes, feed our cattle corn and stuff our chickens in little cages and like pump them full of hormones until they're, they're dying after they're like eight weeks old because their organs are so huge and like nobody wants that, okay? We're all against that. Um, but one thing that he shares in terms of land mass that's really interesting is he says that if you take the entire, all the land on the planet and you put it on a credit card, two thirds of that land is only suitable for grazing animals. So in order for the whole planet to be only eating plants, we have to defy nature, use a ton of fossil fuels, wipe out natural ecosystems because remember there are lots of little animals and critters and birds and butterflies and bees and entire ecosystems that we're destroying and wiping out in order to plant row crops so everyone can eat meat I mean plants so how does that make sense how does that make the planet better we're go we're, we're fighting with nature at that point um, another consideration that he gives on ethics is in, in those areas of the world where there's no way that the, the soil and the environment is not suitable for growing plants. 
he talks about how women in a lot of those areas of the world, the only thing they are allowed to own is animals. They cannot own land. So here, this is like the thing that sustains life for them. And they're being told by the Western world, mostly white Europe and uh, in the United States saying, that's bad. You shouldn't do that. You shouldn't be eating that. That's bad. Right. And they're like, how the hell are we supposed to grow plants? And also this is like my only piece of livelihood that I have. Right. So there's a, there's so many considerations. Rob talks about in that interview are so good. So I highly recommend listening to it just to, just for food for thought, just to be educated because I don't know how to say this. Let me, how do I say this in the best way? Often I find that, um, plant-based advocates are not aware of this information. And so when I'm having discussions with them, I can see that they don't even know about that. And so even if you are a plant-based advocate, I recommend getting a well-rounded perspective and looking at some things outside of the scope of just saying that CAFOs are bad for the planet. These meat factory farm animals are bad for the planet and all this stuff. There's, there's more considerations. There's a lot more to be thinking about than just that. Now, here's another thing. Um, if you are not familiar with how regenerative agriculture works, every human being on the planet needs to learn what regenerative agriculture is. To me, this is the solution because here, here's an example. And some of you, if you've been following me for a while, you may have seen that I did an event out at Rep Provisions Ranch in Oklahoma. They're a regenerative ranch. Um, we did an educational event out there this past summer. So I was out there. We had the Noble Institute, which is the leading institute of research for um, agriculture in, uh, in the country. They came and educated. Um, the Savory Institute backed it. They're the leaders of regenerative agriculture. Alan Savory has an awesome TED talk on this. So we were backed by the Savory Institute and the Noble Research Institute, and they did some awesome education out there. And Eric, the rancher from Rep Provisions, did this awesome demo. When we started planning the event, he literally went out to his beautiful regenerative ranch where it's just, what that means is you just let the grasslands grow, how they naturally grow. You don't mess with the ecosystem and you let the animals just graze on it. And then you move them once they've grazed on it and they've trampled it down and they pooped on it and fertilized it. You move them so that area can grow back even better and more fertilized than it already was. So what he did when we started planning this event is he took a piece of his land and fenced it off and planted a row crop of corn on it. And he had it half and half with a little waterway, you know, with like water coming on it. And so half of it was a row crop of plants, which is, that's how plants are grown is in row crops. So we have soil exposed in between all those corn stalks. It looks really neat and organized and pretty, doesn't it? <laughs> Eric's like, this is the Sahara desert to me. This is like heartbreaking to see soil was like that. The other side's all overgrown. It has flowers growing in it. There's butterflies, bees. It's just this overgrown quote unquote mess of nature. He had water go on the row crops with exposed dirt and then water go on the, the regular side, how nature just grew. And we timed, and I, I can't remember exactly, but it was something like 12 minutes or something until on the row crops that soil started washing into this like PVC pipe that he had cut open to, to get to grab it and we could just see it filling up with a bunch of water and topsoil the other side we gave up after half of a day because it never ran off nothing he's like it's not going to because that those root systems are helping the soil hold the water in so you want to talk climate change this is something really important to think about in terms of which types of food you're eating, animals and plants. I, I like plants too, I eat plants too, but this is so important in terms of balance because that when we lose that topsoil and it runs off and it goes into our rivers and then goes eventually into our oceans, we lose topsoil. And Savory Institute has taught us that we are losing topsoil at a rate faster than we can replenish it we're losing 80 billion tons of topsoil a year into our oceans. And guess what happens when we lose topsoil at a, at a rate faster than we can replenish it? We can't grow food. We can't grow grass for our cattle to eat food either. This is a huge problem. And so row crops saying like, yeah, this would be better for the planet because we're not doing those CAFOs. We're just gonna grow row crops everywhere. And oh, you can't grow plants there. Well, we're going to bring some dirt in and put a bunch of artificial stuff in, into it. 
and then we're going to lose all that too and it's going to run off into the oceans and we are going to lose topsoil and not be able to grow food look into it um, the united nations is on top of it it is a huge huge issue um, and so that's a consideration too only eating plants is really 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 um uh risky i would say in terms of us being able to sustain topsoil at the rate that we need um so again two podcasts that i have that are just so awesome for getting educated on this are eric perner from rep provisions on my inside out health podcast and rob wolf r-o-b-b-w-o-o-l-f okay and you could read his book sacred cow follow diana rogers sustainable dish here on instagram learn about this stuff it's so fascinating um Another consideration is I know a lot of people say they, they just don't want to kill animals uh, and they're worried about how animals are treated. And again, I'll say again, we all are. I, I do not support CAFOs that it's just infuriating. Okay. We don't want our animals raised like that. Eric's ranch, Rep Provisions Ranch, when I was out there, I watched these cattle. I kid you not. I did not know cattle could be so happy. I was like, Eric, am I having some sort of like cognitive bias or are your cattle like literally skipping and jumping and like waving their tails and they're like so happy I've never seen it I did not know cat cattle could behave like that he's like yeah I'm like oh my gosh and those animals are raised on these grasslands and you're like you would not believe it it's taller than me and they're just weaving through it and they're happy as can be skipping their swinging their tails around and they're raised on that until the day that they die Eric takes them on his own truck to their very small processor because they don't use these BS four major processors that are causing so many of the problems. He takes them to his small processor and they are killed very humanely and quickly. They don't know what's coming. Um, Eric shares that cattle are very, they're like dogs. They, they know he's like those cattle that are raised in CAFOs. They know what's going on. They're very sensitive. They know there's death going on around them. They, they feel the pain of not being treated well. He's like, our cattle do not know. They just, we, I take them all in one day in my truck and we, you know, do it very humanely and quickly. Um, another thing I'll share in terms of health information. This is so cool. If you're listening to my podcast, I, I apologize sort of <laughs> for the really long, uh, share that I have about rep provisions on this point at the beginning of my podcast, but it's just so awesome. Eric sent me this email. He's like, Tara, we had our meat independently tested at uh, Michigan state university. He's like, guess what? Our omega six, omega three ratio is one to one. He's like, that is a new, that is like the perfect food. In my opinion, it had a whole bunch of other health benefits too. This is independently tested from them. Okay. So what does that mean? Omega six, omega three ratio. So I, the ideal perfect omega six, omega three ratio is one to one. Omega sixes are in everything. They're in all our food. They're infl- pro inflammatory. That is necessary. That's part of nature. That's part of human biology is you need a spark. It's just like muscle building, right? You need a little bit of inflammation to spark repair and growth and make things even better. So the omega sixes in our food spark that glutathione process, that endogenous inside our body antioxidant process and the omega threes help repair it. But if you're eating a bunch of foods that are say a 25 to one omega six to omega three ratio, that's way more inflammation than is able to be repaired. So meat, this meat for at least from rep provisions, I would say most likely other regenerative ranches are the same or similar. This, this meat gives you that perfect balance. But if you look, go look up, get, get curious, Google, um, omega six, omega three ratio in foods like chicken is really bad right now because it's all grain fed. I think I can't remember what it was when I looked it up. It was really bad. So, and that's because they're being fed grain, which they're not supposed to be eating. And then they get a high, they're more inflammatory, right? So just keep that in mind. I still eat chicken. I do eat rep provisions chicken. They do still supplement with some grain. I asked him about it. He's like, I wish we were at a point where we didn't have to supplement with a little grain, but we're just not there yet. But I know it's gotta be better than the stuff that you're getting at Walmart or Costco, right? So, um, yeah, so health benefits, it does matter. Um, one thing I liked that Rob Wolf said was he's like, I don't want people getting under the impression though, that if all they can afford is meat from Walmart or whatever, that it doesn't have any health benefits. It does. So if you're, you know, watching this and you're like barely making it, you still have all of those nutrient benefits from meat. 
Okay, another on health benefits, one other thing I want to share in, in terms of considering eating meats, um, a case for meat, I guess, is um, omega 3s. So, plant sources of omega 3s versus animal sources. So, nearly almost no plants have DHA, which is that active form of omega-3 that you use specifically for your brain and a bunch of other things in your body. I will say though, algae is a really great plant source of omega-3 that actually has DHA in it. So if you are plant-based, please, I would say just go get some energy bits. I've got a, a live video. I'm going to do a joint interview here on Instagram with the founder of energy bits, Catherine Arnston on Thursday at 6 PM mountain time. Dude, she's so awesome. If anybody saw her last time or heard me on her podcast, she is so intelligent and has so much good information, but she sells these little energy bits that you can just take. I take them, my kids take them and they actually do have DHA in them. But if you're not eating algae, and here's the thing, I don't think a lot of people on plant-based diets are eating algae, right? And so if you're not, I, I got real off on a tangent on this when I was researching for my book. And there are multiple studies that show that almost no ALA, right? That the plant-based forms of omega-3, that there is zero conversion into DHA into the um, study participants' bodies from the plant-based sources. So that is really interesting. So just something to consider, you know, and what happens in animals is animals convert things for us, right? So we, when we eat uh, quality beef or fish, we're getting that active form of EPA and DHA in our bodies. Okay. So it's much more likely you're going to get that if you're eating animal products. Um, what else? I saw some of you guys are commenting. I'm sorry. I'm not going to resist the urge to read them because I'm driving. Um, let's see. Ethical. Environmental. Oh, last thing. Okay. Um, this is also from Rob, Rob Wolf and from Sacred Cow in my interview with him. Uh, I just want to talk about the desertification of the planet again a little more. And this one is really interesting. So Diana Rogers, who helped co-authored that book, Sacred Cow with him, went down to, I believe it was Chihuahua, Mexico, in this total desert area and met with this rancher who was able to turn desert into grassland through regenerative agriculture. If you watch Sacred Cow, the documentary, you'll see that. I saw that. He's like, it's absolutely amazing. He's like, actually that Utah and Nevada, that's where I live. So if you live here and, or have been here and you've taken that drive to Las Vegas, that used to all be rich, luscious grassland. Tall, like as tall as you were taller. What is it now? It's freaking desert. And so um, this guy through regenerative agriculture, through raising cattle, animals, was able to restore a desert area into grasslands. Because guess what? When you have grasslands, you don't need hardly any water. You need hardly any irrigation because the soil sequesters so much moisture because it's not drying out because it's been removed for this monocrop of grass that a lot of cattle are being fed on or worse, bare dirt in between all these row crops. So there's a lot about eating animals that is actually helping the planet if we can support and spread the word about regenerative agriculture. So I um, encourage you to check it out. And, you know, last thing I'll say is if you are plant-based, if you are only eating plants and you know that intuitively, like you're like, I just feel better. Like I support you all the way. I would never ever bash on somebody's intuitive or just knowing from their own experience. Okay. My concern is the emotional ploys, I guess about like, it's so mean to eat animals. I'm like, well, if you're eating plants, animals are dying. Millions of small animals are dying in the process of row crops. Okay, so it's like animals are going to die either way. And actually a lot fewer animals are going to die when we eat beef than millions of small animals um, from row crops. So it's, there's, you know, just something to consider there um, from that side of things. And also like, I just look at the planet and <laughs> Rob said in his interview, 
that like he's like we revised a bunch of you know research and it turned you know the the conclusion that we found was that the best system the most sustainable system that can support food on the planet and be good for the planet is grazing animals on grass with some supportive row crops with sunlight and well, I don't know if he said row crops. He didn't say that part, but grazing animals on grass with sunlight and water and like what nature originally provided. <laughs> Imagine that. And we come in and we meddle, you know, and so in order to only support plants, we will have to waste so many resources, so many fossil fuels. These areas of the world that are arid desert naturally will have to import food from us just to eat that many plants when they could just eat the the cattle that graze on their natural area, you know? So it's just, just a lot of things to consider. Just want to share that with you guys. Food for thought. I'm not bashing anybody. It's just, you know, there's, there's more to the conversation I think than we hear, um, in general. And I do think that if you are plant-based or a plant-based advocate, just look into regenerative agriculture, just with an open mind. It doesn't, I'm not saying you have to change your mind just to know what's out there. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm on a stoplight. So I'll read. Well, last I checked, animals dying for consumption is supposedly putting the ozone layer at risk and helping cause global warming. Yeah, so so actually what's really interesting is when you look at methane and go to Diana Rogers' um, account, Sustainable Dish, she shares a lot about this. Cattle, even, even with the CAFOs, they are such a tiny contributor to methane. I think, it, what was the analogy she gives? Something like bugs put off more methane than cattle or something like that. So... There is some uh, distorted information out there from the pro plant-based side. Um, it's just how it is. There, it's like that in any you know really extreme approach. There's going to be distorted information. Keto can be that way. Carnivore can be that way, right? So um, look into that. Again, it is damaging to the environment. These CAFOs, these you know farm factory farm animals that can be destructive to the land. But actually, like okay, let's talk about global warming. So when we allow the grasslands to grow for regenerative agriculture, guess what? Soil is a huge contributor to carbon sequest sequestration, sequestering carbon, <laughs> making up words, right? Sequestering carbon. The oceans and the soil are our biggest helps on that. And so when we ruin the root systems of all these natural grasslands that are growing, should be growing, that we wipe out for row crops, um, now we are losing our ability to sequester carbon and that is why the oceans are getting overloaded with this and so we need grasslands I, i'll have to share a clip on my instagram i've got this we went out to the uh, the nature preserve in oklahoma near eric's ranch and we saw what america's grasslands just looked like it's it's preserved holy cow it's so beautiful it's just luscious tall grasses as far as you can see and that is how nature intelligently designed it for us to be able to sequester carbon, okay? So we're producing more, and then we're not, we're getting rid of the thing that's gonna help us sequester it, and guess what? When you have cattle on these grasslands, they help it to grow even more. <sighs> so it's actually, regenerative agriculture is a solution to global warming, not, not uh, the opposite, okay? So yeah, get educated on it. Um, one of my favorite documentaries on this, if you haven't seen it, is Kiss the Ground. Excellent. Excellent. They did. They nailed it. Super interesting stuff. So anyway, check that out. Check out my podcast with Eric Perner and Rob Wolf and, um, and sacred cow. Follow Diana Rogers, follow, follow Rob Wolf. Just open your mind to these things because they're super fascinating and actually really, 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 really matter for all of us. Okay. If we want food, if you care about the future of food for like literally your kid's generation or maybe even yourself, <laughs> It matters. So, okay, I'm going to I'm going to bounce. Thank you all for joining me. Bye.